Take your Bibles out, if you would, and uh, open to Micah uh, chapter 6. Micah chapter 6. Good to see you this morning. I, uh, I know it's uh, football season in the South, and, and, so, and it's Saturday, so I, I'm sure that there are a lot of you that are thinking, hey, you know, there's lots of stuff I could be doing today. It's a pretty day. No hurricanes this weekend. Uh, and, uh, uh, but Florida's playing tonight, so I, I do appreciate that you're here this morning. Uh, some of you, Florida had the 11 o'clock game this morning. There might have been some of you that uh, were tending to not be here. But uh, you're here on a Saturday. Uh, that says a lot about your interest in spiritual things. I appreciate that. It's an encouragement to me. I hope our studies today will be an encouragement to you as well. Uh, when we were planning for the, for, for the events of the weekend and for the things that we want to talk about, I had a couple of conversations with your elders, one fairly lengthy one. Uh, and, and we were talking about uh, things that they felt like that we uh, ought to talk about. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we had a list as long as your arm and finally kind of had to say, okay, we can't cover everything uh, in three or four or five lessons. So let's kind of narrow it down a little bit. And, and, uh, and, and so we've, we've talked about the stuff that, that, uh, that we wanted to study together. So I, I say that because I want you to understand uh, the lessons that we're going to uh, study uh, today and tomorrow and, and last night are, were very intentionally chosen uh, for a number of reasons, uh, most of which pertain to your elders and, and the things that they see here. So uh, if you wonder wh why did you decide to do these things, uh, these, this, these, these choices are mostly your overseer's choices. If you don't like them, gripe at them, okay? Don't, don't gripe at me, go gripe at them. Uh, but one of the things we did talk about was maybe having uh, some interactive studies. And I thought about that a good bit. There's a part of me, I, I'd, I'd much rather teach class than I would preach. I enjoy uh, the, the interaction of study. The problem with that is sometimes uh, you don't get through the material that you want to cover. And, and so here's what I want to do this morning. Uh, I'm, I'm very tempted to say, okay, I'm just going to ask questions, and if you have comments or uh, questions you want to ask as we go through the study, please fire away. My fear is, if that happens, that we might end up chasing rabbits and not finish what I want to talk about. So here's what I want to do this morning. Uh, we're going to cover this material, and I'm going to do it uh, 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 just basically like a sermon. Uh, sorry. Yeah, so for the first 35, 40 minutes, you're just going to have to listen. But when I'm finished, if you have questions uh, or things that you'd like to address, uh, we, we'll, we'll, we'll take some opportunity to do that. So here's my suggestion. As we're studying through this material, if there's something in the material that you really want to ask about, jot it down. Yeah, I hope you got a pen and piece of paper. Uh, and, and then when we're finished, uh, we'll even be willing to take some general questions, although you know I'm uh, not going to do a study of eschatology and revelation uh, this morning. But we do want to take the opportunity to study some things that you'd like to talk about. So that's kind of the way things are going to go today. Uh, we'll look at Micah chapter 6 this morning and look at some things uh, from Leviticus uh, this afternoon. So uh, turn to Micah chapter 6. Uh, and I want to start this way. If I were to ask you to define the word good, <clears throat> what would pop in your mind? Uh, the chances are pretty good what you're thinking right now is all the ways that we use the word. It is a very widely used word. We use it to describe everything from barbecue in the South as opposed to barbecue in Texas. We had this discussion last night. Uh, from my perspective, there is no good brisket in Florida. And you can argue with me about that later. But to be honest with you, there's no really good pulled pork in Texas. And, and, and so w w we think of ways that we describe things. Uh, you know, I think my kids are pretty good kids. Uh, I, I, my football team's not such a good football team. Your football team might be a really good football team. Uh, and, and you start down that path. Uh, we use the word good to describe all kinds of stuff. And the interesting and ironic thing about it is that it's nearly always subject to some kind of debate. Uh, what you think is good and what I think is good may not be the same. And the reason is because we're using different standards. Now, back to the definition. The word good, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, takes six pages to define. But ultimately, they all boil down to good being a measure of quality. Uh, and, 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 
and that's all well and good when it comes to all the different things that we use the word to describe, whether it's our football teams or food that we like or, or the, the, the quality of our automobiles or the weather in one place or the living conditions or whatever you want to use that word to describe. Uh, we can differ on all those things because your standards, my standards may not be the same. But there's an area of great import in regards to that concept in the world that is of great significance. And, and that is when it comes to deciding what's morally good, what's right or what's wrong. Uh, we're living in a culture that is very confused in regards to its standards of morality, of, of, of right and wrong. And you're, you're well aware of that. You just look around at things that people in our world accept as okay, uh, and that you and I would say, no, that's not okay, and, and, and suddenly we're at odds with those around us. And very often the problem is that when we try to talk about these things, they want to use different standards than we're using. Now, please understand, we're not the first people in history to go through a cultural kind of, uh, I would say, uh, digression. Some people might say revolution. I saw an article the other day that said, you know, the woke culture of our age is the same thing as the hippie movement in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and some of you are shaking your head. You obviously lived through the 60s and 70s, and you see some differences between what we're seeing now and what we're seeing then. But that's the way a lot of people look at it. But this has been going on for generations. Isaiah chapter 5, 700 years before Christ. Woe to you put light for dark and dark for light, who put sweet for bitter and bitter for sweet, who put good for evil and evil for good. I mean, Isaiah was dealing with it in his day, and Micah, who would have been a contemporary, was seeing it in his day. And there's this passage in Micah chapter 6 that uh, is extremely important to us who are trying to serve God. And, and, and I recognize this is an Old Testament passage, but if you haven't recognized it yet, most of the New Testament principles that we value so highly are consistent principles that God introduced long before Jesus came into the world. Uh, and that is true in this passage of Scripture. So I want to look at verses 6 through 8. Now I want to start and I'm going to read down that far and offer just a little bit of context uh, and then talk about what Micah has to say to us, what God has to say to us, relative to the idea of how do you define what is good. Uh, Micah chapter 6 begins in verse 1. Uh, and, and let me set this up. This is a kind of a portrayal of a courtroom scene. Uh, you'll notice some language. If you look at verse 2, the Lord's complaint is used twice, and then at the very end, he will contend with Israel. The word contend literally means to bring charges against. And he's calling witnesses. And what God does is he, he, he offers charges against his people that they would tell him why they've left him. It's like, I, I'm, I'm suing you, now you defend yourself. And the way that I understand the passage to work is that that's what God does in the first, oh, three or four, let's see, where does this end? Uh, the first five verses. And then in verse six, you have a reply. And I think basically Micah's reply is, we don't really have a good argument for why we are where we are. Uh, how do we fix it? Now, that's the way I understand this chapter to work, uh, and that's the way I'm going to read it. And so uh, if you'll read it together with me, then we'll talk about Micah's reply. So here, here's, here's God's charge, verse 1. Hear now what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains. There's your witnesses. Plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear your voice. Hear, O you mountains, the Lord's complaint. And you strong foundations of the earth, the Lord has a complaint against his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Testify against me. I brought you up from the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of bondage. I sent before you Moses and Aaron and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, counseled, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him. And if you don't get that reference... Balak hired Balaam to curse God's people, and rather than that, God made Balaam bless God's people. So, so God's argument is, I'm just taking care of you. This is illustrative of the point we made about God last night. Uh, I, I've taken care of you. Uh, 
Remember what Balaam the son of Baor answered him from Acacia Grove to Gilgal, and other three different times, that you may know the righteousness of the Lord. I am innocent. You have no right to have walked away from me, is the idea. And here's Micah's reply. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the Most High God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will he be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Now, I want to make three observations here because I find a lot of parallels between God's charge and Micah's reply and what's going on in the world around us. And, and, and here would be the first one. In, in verses 6 and 7, when Micah says, uh, essentially, how do I fix this? With what shall I come before the Lord? I, I want you to notice Micah's first proposition. Does God just want me to be a good worshiper? And, and here's, the, here's, here's the point I would make if you're taking notes. In the eyes of God religiosity or the kind of vain empty practice of religion is not a substitute for godliness good is not simply defined by the idea of of empty worship and, and i want you to appreciate as you well do and we made this point we offered some uh some statistics last night we live in a religious culture it, it is interesting to me the 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 dichotomy of of our culture because there's a church on every street corner. I, I mean, in old West Texas slang, I'm sorry for the image, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a church building. Uh, and, and, and the reason for that is most people, as I mentioned last night, still identify religion as fairly important. I, like 70%, uh, between 70, uh, three quarters of people in the country basically think religion has some real value in, in our world. A lot of people believe in God. There, there are still a fairly significant amount of people that believe in the Bible, and yet, uh, it's just odd to me. Uh, some of this is tradition. Our country was founded on a lot of religious principles, and anybody that reads the Constitution can see the reflection of God, of, of people's views about God uh, as our forefathers came and established this nation, and uh, established the Bill of Rights and, and the Constitution and the, and the prologue and all of our under God stuff and our freedoms that are, that are given to us as rights of birth. I, and I, and I, don't, I don't disagree with that stuff. Uh, so we have this traditionally religious background. And I want you to appreciate that was true in Micah's day as well. If you have your bookmark there in chapter 3 or chapter 6, excuse me, flip back to chapter 1 and... Uh, look at chapter 1 and verse 7. I'm just going to read two or three verses here. Chapter 1 and verse 7, God says through Micah, uh, All her carved images will be beaten to pieces, and all her pay as a harlot will be burned with the fire. All her idols I will lay desolate. She gathered it from the pay of a harlot, and they shall return to the pay of a harlot. Skip over to chapter 3. Probably should just a page over. Uh, verse 5. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who make my people stray, who chant peace while they chew with their teeth, but who prepare war against him who puts nothing in their mouths. Therefore, you'll have a night without vision, and you'll have darkness without divination, and the sun will go down on the prophets, and the day will be dark for them. The seers will be ashamed, the diviners abashed. They will all cover their lips, for there is no answer from God. As you read through Micah, God makes several references to religion. And if you're looking at that, you're probably thinking, well, wait a minute. He's talking about idolatry that he's condemning. Yes, he is. But idolatry is religion. And especially to the children of Israel in the northern part, uh, what, what we think of as Samaria or Israel in the divided kingdom age, they had embraced Baal worship or they had taken the worship of, jo of Jehovah, of Yahweh, and they had perverted it in regards to the golden calves, changed the feast days, changed the priesthood. But they were very religious, and that's what God is addressing here. You know, all your religious activity, I'm going to bring to destruction. It's just a matter of time. Paul does the same thing, by the way, in the New Testament in Acts chapter 17. Do you remember when he goes to Athens, and he goes through and sees all of the idols, and he sees one that's dedicated to the unknown God? Do you remember that story? Uh, one person. Okay, yes, 
Yes, I remember. No. Uh, I'll sit down here till you make up your mind if we need to. Uh, and, and what does Paul say to them when he starts talking to them? I perceive that you're very religious people. And they were. They believed in greater powers, sometimes very personal greater powers. And that was the case in Micah's day. And, and it is the case in our day. Uh, the interesting thing about it is, while you have all these religious people, uh, you still have a lot of immorality. Would you agree with that? Do, do you think the world, do you think the United States of America is a better place morally now than it was 20 years ago? And if you're my age, then you start going back farther than that, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. And for those of you who are a little bit older, 60 or 70 years ago, uh, and our brother that's 90, what, 96, 97, I mean, we're talking about uh, under the old law now, okay? <laughs> you, you know, and we look and we see uh, uh, what is a deterioration. And everybody agrees with that. People who are morally concerned say, you know, the world is more dishonest than it was. Uh, the world is more violent than it was. The, the world is certainly much more sexually promiscuous uh, than it was. There's more pride. There's more arrogance. There's more disregard of others. We live in a world that, for a lot of us as Christians, just look around and think, man, it's just, it's going to the dogs, and it's going to the dogs in a hurry. And yet, three-quarters of the people in this country consider religion to be fairly important. Do, do, do you see a disconnect there? Uh, what's interesting about religion in our day and age, at least where I live, and I suspect it's probably the same thing here, is in the, the major Christian religious organizations, have put a lot of focus on uh, entertainment. I don't know another way to say it. It's all about the worship, the music, the lights, the action, the dynamic speakers, the, the stage show. And people go to be pumped up and entertained and made to feel good about themselves. But then they go out the next day and they lie and cheat and steal. Sometimes in the name of business, sometimes just out and out. So what we have is a religious culture that's not very godly. Do you see that? Now, here, here's the reason I bring this up. Is that what God wants? Does he want good worshipers? He wants people to come on Sunday and praise God and sing our songs and uh, talk about how wonderful Jesus is and then go home and just live however we want to live? Is, is that good in the eyes of God? Is that the way he defines it? I want you to appreciate the real danger for those of us that are really trying to do right according to the Bible, who have chosen God's standard to be the standard of good. It's not just the fact that we live in this world. It is the fact that this world influences the way that we think. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33 uh, says, Do not be deceived. Evil communications corrupt good morals. You remember that passage of Scripture? If you raised kids, uh, and I did, you use this passage probably on more than one occasion. Uh, and, and it, you know, your kids want to go do something because that's what everybody around them is doing. And, and the, first, the, the first question you ask them is, if all your friends were jumping off of a cliff, would you jump off of a cliff? Which is a really poor question to ask because the answer is yes, you know. If all their friends were jumping off cliffs, they'd go jump off cliffs. You don't believe that? Go back and look at the Tide Pod Challenge. Can you imagine? Y you know, sometimes our young people don't use their heads very well, and I didn't use mine when I was young. Some of you date back to Florida College with me uh, would probably remember some of that. And so we tell our kids, look, you, you, you need to be careful. And then this passage is the next thing we evoke after the jump off the cliff illustration. We'll say, well, you know, the Lord says evil communications corrupt good morals or good manners. Let me ask you something, uh, and you don't have to answer out loud. Do you know what 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is talking about? 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is a discussion of the reality, the truth of the resurrection from the dead. And the fact that there were people in Corinth, obviously, who did not believe that in a resurrected body. And that was very true in Paul's day. As he preached, especially among the Gentiles, uh, that's the big problem he ran into in Athens in Acts chapter 17. When he mentioned the resurrection of the dead, 
that, uh, <laughs> I just thought this guy's a philosophical seed picker. He's just picking stuff here and there. And that's when they pretty much shut it down. They didn't, they didn't believe necessarily in a resurrected body like you and I do. And so when Paul writes this letter, 1 Corinthians 15, he defends the reality of the resurrection and, and essentially says we, we believe in that our bodies are going to be raised because we believe that Jesus was raised. And he is the firstborn of the resurrection. And if he's not raised, our faith is in vain and we're still in our sins and we're not going to be raised. And then he entertains these questions. Okay, well, what's the resurrection going to look like? How's it going to be? Uh, what kind of bodies? And, and so that's what the whole chapter is about. It is what we would call a doctrinal discussion as opposed to a practical discussion, which is a, a poor division because ultimately what you believe is going to manifest itself in how you act. But I want you to appreciate when Paul right in the middle of this says, don't be deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners or good morals. What he's saying is, if you listen too much to people who teach and accept and believe things that are not true, sooner or later, you're going to be influenced by them. And that's what we need to remember here. Yeah, being around a bunch of folks that are drinking and dancing and partying may well influence us, but, I, but, I, but it is much more likely that you spend a lot of time with people who do not believe truth that their beliefs will impact you. And this is the danger we have to watch for in our day and age when it comes to how you define good. Because I'm going to tell you folks, in my experience, uh, brethren very often kind of follow the trends of society. We're just two or three decades behind them. And if you don't believe that, just look at views in our day and age about uh, uh, the, the, the indwelling and the work of the Holy Spirit, which rushed through the denominational world three or four decades ago, used to be limited to the Pentecostal world now. Everybody, and I see more and more of our brethren embracing some of these ideas. We, we just tend to follow culture. And if culture thinks it's okay to be religious and ungodly, that's where we'll go. And that's the question Micah asks. God says, what have I done that you've deserted me? And Micah says, what, what do I, how do I fix this? Do, do, I, do I bring calves of a year old? Do, 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 I, do I make sure and make all the right sacrifices? And then he goes from there to, uh, do I bring not just calves of a year old, but, but how about thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Maybe it's quantity. If I just make lots of sacrifices, will that satisfy God? And he even goes one step further. If I kill my children, uh, you know, uh, human sacrifice was never a part of God's work. It was very much part of the idolatrous world, but it was not a part of God's world. Uh, and, and, and Micah even entertains that. If I gave you the most valuable thing that I have, would, would things be okay between us? And, and I want you to appreciate that uh, it's not what God's looking for. God doesn't expect us to show up, even on a Saturday morning. I, I, I mean, I really am appreciative of you being here. This is not the typical time that we worship. You're sacrificing some things that you like to do today, and, and, and I appreciate that. That's an encouragement to me. But coming to services and worshiping well and then going off and living however we want to is not how God defines good. And I find it interesting that Micah starts this this way because this is the world we live in. Does that make sense to you? Do you see that? So we need to be careful that we're not influenced to think the way the world around us is thinking. What God's looking for is not just good worshipers. So, so what is he looking for? How do you define good? Well, go to the next verse, if you would, in Micah 6, and, and look at verse 8. He has shown you, old man, what is good. Stop right there. Let's make a point about this. Micah's point, uh, God's point through Micah, is that uh, God defines what's right and wrong. God defines what's good and evil, and it always has to be that way, and this has to be where we, this has to be the hill we're willing to die on in our day and age. That, that we believe in an objective standard of reality that, that is true for all mankind, and God has established that. And the challenge is <clears throat> our society is becoming more and more relativistic. 
or subjectivism is taking over, if you understand that. People who study this stuff, and sometimes if a preacher comes in and really wants to impress you, he'll preach on postmodernism. And, and, and all that means is he's just going to tell you everybody out there is doing what's right in their own eyes. That's what happened uh, in the judges. And that's kind of where we are in our day and age, that, that, that a lot of people in our world, and this is true especially as you get younger, and you younger folks that are here this morning, uh, if you're still in, in school, in junior high, high school, if you're in college, you're seeing this. I mean, this is all over the place now that we get to decide what is right and wrong. What's right is what I think is right. What's wrong is what I think is wrong. And I'm not amenable or accountable to any standard out here. Maybe it's the culture defines it. That's the idea of political correctness. The culture says this is okay and this is not. It's okay to involve yourself in same-sex uh, sexual activity uh, and it is wrong to... Uh, in, in any way oppose that. Uh, it's just backwards of the way we think, but that's what culture has defined, and people buy into that idea. Or this idea of, well, it's all relative. What's right depends on the situation. And this goes back to thinking that I first got exposed to probably in the 70s. You, you remember, for those of you who date back that far, you remember the old uh, situation ethics illustration? You're in a lifeboat. There's four people in the lifeboat, six people in the lifeboat. There's only enough food for a couple of days. You eat up all the food. Who do you decide that you're going to kill and eat next? And you think, you've got to be kidding. Really? But that was the, in the situation, what's the right thing? Well, it all depends. You know, if there's somebody weak and they're not going to help everybody else survive, then he's going first and we're just going to eat him and we're going to survive on him. And then you go down the list and you decide who you're going to kill. The idea that killing is wrong never enters into the equation. Now, that was situation ethics in my younger years. Now, that's just moral relativism. What's right is right depending on the situation. And that's the way a lot of people think. You, you know, abortion very often is, is uh, justified in that regard. Well, in this situation or that situation, it's okay to kill a child. And that's the way our culture thinks. And, and, and good and evil is being replaced by this kind of thinking, and, and it demands all kinds of of toleration and acceptance on our part. You know, if you don't think like everybody else thinks, then you're wrong. And you run into that, don't you? I've got a friend that worships over in the Houston area, and where he worships, the congregation is mostly comprised of white-collar people, people who work in the corporate office business world. Uh, and some of those companies are very, very sensitive to what's going on in the culture, especially when June rolls around and all the gay pride activities take place. And y'all have, have just a little bit of that here, don't you? And, and, and in his company, during Pride Week, they, they have to wear lanyards with their credentials on them. Some of you may have to do that in your company. And they hand out rainbow-colored lanyards, and, and, and basically they tell them, you wear the lanyard if you want your job. You know, Christians for a long time kind of been on the fringe of society, but, but I don't know a lot of people who've actually been threatened with the loss of their job because of their faith, but that's where we are now. That's the world they're living in. And, and, and so my point is, those who have this kind of fuzzy view of what's right and wrong, I choose what's right and wrong, you can't tell me what's right and wrong, but you have to accept my view. I don't have to accept your view, but you have to accept my view. And, and that is the world that we are living in. And, and, and it is that way, I think, because as long as I get to set my own standards, I'm not accountable. If I don't believe in God, I can act any way I want to act, do anything I want to do, and I don't have to feel guilty about it. It is a way that people try to deal with guilt. Because we are made in the image of God, and we are moral people. I don't care who you are and how you're raised. At some level, you deal with guilt in your life when you do something's wrong even though you will say, well, it's really not wrong. Well, well, why do I feel guilty? And I'm going to tell you where this leads, okay? And nobody likes to talk about this, but it is the truth. When we become subjective in the way that we look at right and wrong, we all become our own gods. We just worship what we want. And inevitably, where it's going is, 
if you and I have a disagreement, or, or what's even more is, if, if you've got something that I want, I, I told you last night I like to hunt and fish, I like to play golf. If I'm a moral relativist and you're a moral relativist and you've got a shotgun that I really like and I come and take your shotgun from you, uh, you're going to tell me, hey, you have no right to do that. And I'm going to say, yeah, I have every right to do it. I don't think it's wrong. And you're going to say, I think it's wrong. Well, it doesn't matter what you think. only matters what I think. What you think makes no difference to me. We're not accountable to some standard out here. I decide what's right for me. You decide what's right for you. And if I'm bigger and stronger or I have more power, I can take anything I want from you. And that's where our society's going, folks. Mark my words. That's where it's going. How do you live with that? Our young people, how, how are you guys going to live in school, in college, in 20 years when it just gets worse? How are you going to live and try to serve the Lord? Well, I, I think this probably is the challenge of our generation. We have to be willing to stand up and say, God defines what is right and what is wrong. Good and evil is not something that is constructed by me and my own personal worldview. Good and evil is defined by the Creator. And creation is the issue. If God is God, and if God is the Creator, then God has the right to dictate to His creation. That's how important is the idea of, uh, of origins and where we came from. What difference does it make? I've heard people say, what difference does it make if we've evolved? The difference it makes is if God is God and we're made in His image, then we're moral beings like He's a moral being and right and wrong is defined by Him and we're answerable to Him and, and, and Him being the Creator is what makes me accountable. And that's why Jesus could say in Matthew chapter 28, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. So go preach the gospel to every creature. Go make disciples of all the world. Uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them, listen, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded. Why? Because I'm the Creator. I get to decide what's right or wrong. I made everything. I'll bring everything into judgment. I get to decide. So we're back to where we started last night. How, how do you see God? And upon what basis have you constructed your vision of God? Our vision of God needs to be based on God's revelation. It's the only way we can know about what God wants. Now, we can know He's there by looking at creation, but knowing what He wants, knowing what the authority says, knowing what's right or wrong, has to come from our devotion to the revelation of God. And I'm, i got news for it. It takes some courage in this day and age to stand up and say, this is what I believe. I believe the Bible is right, and it defines good. And that's what I'm going to follow. And uh, it's going to take some courage. And, and, and there's, some, there's issues that, that, that remain somewhat unanswered here that are really going to be hard to deal with. I was teaching the high school class years ago. This has probably been 20 or 25 years ago. And uh, we were going through, you know, challenges of youth, that, that kind of thing, you know, uh, uh, immodesty and drinking and all these things that our young people become confronted with when they start leaving home and start working on their own more and more. And we were talking about dancing. Uh, and, and by the way, if you're raising young people, you need to give some serious consideration to what the Bible has to say about sensuality and sexuality and lasciviousness as it pertains to dancing. And so what I did with the kids is I said, okay, let's take every passage in the Bible that mentions dancing in any way so we talked about the, 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 the daughters of Israel dancing at the end of the crossing of the Red Sea. And we talked about David dancing before the Lord when they brought the tabernacle in. And we talked about Herod's uh, stepdaughter, Salome, dancing in front of... And, and so we went through the whole Bible. And when we were finished, the conclusion that I offered to them is the Bible does not paint a picture in any way that, that, uh, that condones a dancing that involves any kind of sensuality, you know, uh, my wife's an Alabama fan. Alabama scores a touchdown. She does a touchdown dance all around the living room, okay? There's nothing sensual about it whatsoever. That's okay. 
And, and there, are, there are movements to music. People say, well, you just don't know. There are movements to music that don't involve any kind of sensuality. I recognize that. It's not the act of moving to music that's the problem. It's the sensuality. And so I make this argument, and we were finished, and I said, is there any questions? A little girl in the back. I can, I can close my eyes and see this happening. She raised her hand and said, well, I think it's okay. And, and honestly, I was dumbfounded because we'd spent 40 minutes talking about what God says. And her reply was, but I think. And that's the problem we have to deal with in our day. We have to decide what I think is insignificant, what I feel is insignificant. Uh, if you ever have the chance to study with someone who is given to same-sex attraction, someone who identifies themselves as a homosexual or somebody as lesbian, this is, I, I've had a number of studies, and this has always been the argument, but this is what I feel. I've, this, is, this is the way I've always been attracted. And I know people that will say, well, you need to tell them that's not true. I can't tell somebody that they don't feel the way they feel. And here's what I tell them. God still expects me to control and exercise my feelings in a way that is consistent with his revelation. I, I was born with a real short temper. I don't know why. Spend 30, 40 minutes, minutes with me, and I'll get mad at you about something. I guarantee you. Now, I may not tell you, and I may work really hard and not show it to you, but it's there. I don't know where it comes from. But it wells up in me like a monster. And my argument, when I've discussed with people the idea of these emotions and how we feel, my argument is this. Can I exercise my emotions any way I want to? If I feel like punching you in the face because I don't like something you said, is that okay? God tells me it's not okay, but that's the way I feel. If I feel okay, surely it is right. No. God's standard says you were created with a will, and you have the, the ability to exercise temperance over your body, and that's actually the issue where sin becomes involved, when we let our desires and our feelings overwhelm our logic and our, and, and our reason and our will. That's what James chapter 1 tells us. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. This standard that God gives us because He's God and we are not has to be our touchstone. Everything we do and think, if we're going to serve the Lord, God defines what's right. And that's what Micah says. He's shown you. And actually, when he says he's shown you, you could take that a step further and look at the revelation of God where right is illustrated over and over and over and over in the Scriptures, how you go about doing what is right. God not only tells us, God shows us, this is what faith pursues, and this is the challenge of our day. And, and again, you young folks, I'm not trying to jump on you, but I tell you, y'all got a tough road ahead of you. You're going to have to decide. I trust that God's that God's will is, is revealed in the Bible. And this is what I'm going to live by. And this is right and wrong because God is God and I am not. And then you're going to have to stick by your guns and the chances are pretty good you're going to have issues because of it. But if we don't stand up, how's the world ever going to see what God defines as right? So he has shown you what is good, and, and we have to dedicate ourselves to that standard. And then here's my last observation. Micah finishes, or God finishes, Micah finishes answering this in verse 8 by saying, What does the Lord require of you to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Uh, when we look at what it is that God wants, we've already touched on the idea that God's not just looking for worship. God wants us to worship. God's revealed patterns about when we are to worship and how we are to worship, and I'm not denying that that's vitally important. I think it is. I don't think we have the right to change God's patterns about what local churches should or shouldn't do, can and can't do. But serving God's a lot more than that. It's a lot more than having the right answers to whether or not we can use an instrument of music in worship or whether we're supposed to take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. Those are important matters. But just because you've got all that down right doesn't mean that that's all that God's looking for. In fact, all of those things should lead to Micah's conclusion. What is it that God really wants? What God wants is us to be like God. That's the way he designed us. The problem that confronts us is, as we mentioned last night, we don't do very well with our blessings and we get selfish and we sin. 
And we can't fix that. Once you're guilty, you can't unguilty. Only God can fix that, and that's why Jesus came as a sacrifice. That's why redemption is important. But God doesn't just want us to accept Jesus and be good worshipers. God wants us to take our innocence that he has offered to us and work very, very hard at being godly people. And so he offers these principles. He wants you to do justice. And this just means do what's right. Every situation. Every situation. Big, small, doesn't matter. God says don't do it, we don't do it. God says do it, we do it. If it's honesty, you know, you get too much change at Starbucks, give them the money back. I know they don't need it. They got plenty. But it's not about who they are. It's about who we are, who we decide to be. If, if somebody beats you to a parking space, let them have it. Do you ever go to Walmart and have that conundrum where you, you, there's somebody about to back out and there's a car pulls up here and a car pulls up there? You, have that happened to you? Shake your head yes. I know it has. Uh, and, and if they back out towards you, you're toast because the other guy's going to jump in. But if they back out toward them because you were there first, all is right with the world. And you get to pull in. And I've had people whip in in front of me when I was waiting before, and I just wanted to roll down my window and say, you're going to lose your soul for that right there, because that's wrong. <laughs> but I want you to understand something. There is a level on which that is wrong. It shows no regard for other people. It shows no regard for loving your neighbor. It shows no regard for this common idea of, of, of rights. We have to be the people in every situation that are the ones doing what's right, what's just. That's what God wants, to love mercy. Mercy is the idea, essentially, when it's human to human, of, of just simple compassion, of, of being attentive to, to what other people are going through. Uh, whether you want to look at the story of the Good Samaritan, you know, here's somebody in need laying by the road, and the religious people passing by, and the Samaritan who's hated by the Jews is the one who stops. And Jesus even asked the lawyer, who, who was the one who, 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 uh, who loved his neighbor? And, and even the lawyer had to admit it was the guy that showed mercy. Well, that has to be us, and I, I know that's risky. It's risky in our day and age to, to stop and help somebody with a flat tire or, or try to be the person who's always there helping uh, who's going and cleaning up after hurricane. I understand all the risks associated with these things, trying to help people that are in need, but that has to be the people that we are, not because they're deserving. You, you might say, well, you know, if I help that guy right there, he, he's just going to take, take anything I give him. He's just going to go buy alcohol or drugs. Maybe he is. The question is not whether he deserves your help. The question is whether or not I'm being godly. That's the point in Matthew chapter 5. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And Jesus said, but I say, love your enemy. Bless those that curse you, do good to those that hate you, pray for those that despitefully use you and persecute you. Well, wait a minute. If they hate me, they curse me, they use me, they, uh, they don't deserve my help. The very next statement, Jesus says, that you may be the children of your Father who is in heaven, who sends his rain on the good and the evil, and his son to shine on the just and the unjust. God will take care of all the justice and injustice, our job is to be compassionate, merciful people because that's the God we serve. And we don't know who we can bring to the truth by our compassion. And, and, and then finally, walk humbly. And, and this is the key, folks. All sin at some level starts with my own pride and selfishness, what I want instead of what God wants. And the sooner I learn to embrace the, the principle of humility... Jesus tells his apostles when they're arguing about who's going to be the greatest. He said, look, in the kingdom of God, understand in the world you've got those who are great and they rule over them and then those who are, those who are in power and they rule over them. But he, he said, that's not the way my world works. My reign, greatness is measured in servitude. Greatness is measured in humility. Philippians chapter 2. Let this mind be in you, who all, which also was in Christ, who being in the form of God, did not think equality with a God was a thing to be grasped or held on to, but, but, but emptied himself, made himself of no reputation, took on himself the form of a servant. That has to be us. And I'm going to tell you, serving God and standing up for God's standards is, is, is much, much easier when we're more concerned about what God wants than about what we want. In fact, you want to know why Jesus was successful? 
I, I enjoy talking about the temptation of Jesus because it intrigues me that Jesus lived 30 some odd years on this earth and never sinned. And I don't think he did it because he used his divine power. I think he did that for one simple reason. How, how could he go through his teenage years? You know, my teenage years weren't great. And most teenagers aren't real good. I used to tell my girls, you need to make friends with some older people. And they'd say, why? And I said, because you and your friends are all idiots. Your brains don't work well. You don't make good decisions. You don't make good judgments. Get to know some older people who helpfully, hopefully will cause you a little bit of wisdom. And that's the way young people are when you're developing. You don't think through things. How did Jesus go through that? Because in John chapter 6, he said, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And when we humble ourselves to the point that all we're concerned about is doing what God wants us to do, then doing justice and loving mercy and standing up for God's standard is much easier because all we're concerned about is pleasing our Father. And so we live in this world that has just kind of uh, lost its way in regards to right or wrong. Satan is really good at what he does. And our culture is very much under his sway. And for those of us that are Christians, it presents a lots of challenges. And we need to understand and be willing to stand up if now, if ever, that God defines what's good. Not me, not you, not the culture, not the administration that's in charge, not, not education, not academia, uh, not uh, southern culture, not western culture, not Texas, not Florida, not the Florida governor or the Texas governor or the governor of Massachusetts. None of those define what's good. God defines what's good. And it's okay if we disagree about a lot of things. Uh, we've talked about food while we've been here. I I'll eat nearly anything. I absolutely despise liver. There is no way you could fix liver that, that would make it good. Now, somebody in this room right now is thinking, oh, but I love liver. Liver's great. And you're going to come up to me. I know because I've used this illustration I don't know how many times, and, and it never fails. Somebody's going to come up and say, you know, you're wrong about that liver stuff. And I just want to say, do you remember anything else that we talked about? <laughs> it's an illustration. And the illustration is we can disagree about that. That's okay. There's no eternal consequences. But when it comes to right and wrong, God sets the standard, and that has to be the people that we are. And so I, I encourage you, this idea of what is good is vitally important, and there's not very many folks in our world that are going to stand up for it. We have to be the ones that do. That all make sense to you? All right, so questions or comments? Understanding I have the right to say no, I'm not going to talk about that. Anybody? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, I probably don't travel around as much as you think I do, let me say, first of all. But it, it is a valid question, and, and, and I, get to, yeah, I, get, I get to travel a little bit. I'll tell you what I see, uh, not only from my experience, but uh, knowing, uh, knowing preachers in other congregations, and preachers talk shop like everybody else does, and so we, we talk about things that we face. Uh, in our young people, I think some of the obvious issues that we address as moral issues are perhaps much more prominent than they were uh, when I was, say, in high school and college, uh, namely the acceptance of immodesty. You know, uh, young men and young women just exposing themselves. I don't know any other way to say it. Uh, and, and I don't mean to be improper at all in any way, but uh, I've seen personally, and I have friends in other congregations that tell you the same thing, uh, young women who come to services in many skirts with thongs on, and half the men in the congregation have seen their bare rear end. I don't mean to offend anybody, but, but that happens. It might happen here, I don't know. But you ask, what, what do I see? I see issues like that. I think sexual 
promiscuity is probably much more common than we would like to think. I think it was probably more common in my youth than was admitted, but now it's very brazen and accepted. When I was in school, there were certain boys and girls who had reputation for being sexually immoral, but not everybody. It wasn't widespread. And uh, I mean, one of, our, one of our ladies is a teacher, and she was telling me not too long ago about a fight between two girls at school, and the fight was over a boy, which, well, okay. But the fight was over the boy because they were both sleeping with the boy. And what made it all worse is the two girls were sleeping with each other. And so they're all involved in this section. Now this is, we live in a pretty conservative little town. And this is in a conservative town. Now these people weren't Christians as you and I would define Christians, but they, but they were people who would be affiliated with Christianity in the broad sense. I think that's just so commonplace. The acceptance of homosexuality as, you know, my kids' views about homosexuality, they agree it's sinful, but they're, but they're much more tolerant of it than I was in my day. In my day, it, it, you know, that was just reprehensible. And now, young people see it as, it's out there, it's common, it's a part of our world. Is it accepted? Not necessarily, but it is much more tolerated. And I think, on the whole, whether you want to talk about honesty, you know, there's lots of problems with cheating in school, just fundamental issues of morality, I think have crept in to churches. Parents either are, are having a harder time dealing with it or they're just turning a blind eye to it. Uh, I've had discussion with some of our folks about uh, their kids that, are, that, that go to dances. And basically what they've told me is, well, we're just trying to let them make their own decisions. And, and I said, you know, it's a 15-year-old kid. You go back to the jump off the cliff. If everybody, their friends are jumping off a cliff, the chances are pretty good. They, they give it some thought. And, and yet, as parents, sometimes we won't stand up and enforce rules on our children because we're afraid they're going to rebel. And I, dealt, well, I have three daughters, man. It's hard to find modest clothes. Uh, it, it's, it's hard to get them to see that you're going to have to be different. Two of my girls played soccer. And I don't know if you've looked at soccer uniforms on women these days. Uh, they used to be knee length. Now they're not much more than volleyball shorts. And we made our girls wear uh, undergarments, Spanx. And uh, it was an issue. And, and they're good girls. They're, they try to be modest. But it was, it was just different. And that's hard. And it's hard as a parent to stand up and say, this is what's going to happen with us. And I'm going to make these decisions and we're going to enforce them in my household until you're old enough to start thinking wisely about why these things are important. That's what I see happening. It's just fundamental stuff that is so accepted in culture uh, th that it's more accepted among our people. And, uh, and there's a lot of adults that, you know, if you, if you preach about dancing, you're, you're going to catch an earful or they're not going to like what you have to say, and they're not going to speak to you for a little while. And uh, it's a shame. But that's, that, does that answer your question? That's what I see. That's what I hear from friends of mine. Uh, it's just the culture creeps in. So, uh, I, I, and, and that doesn't even start to answer the conceptual influences of, you know, uh, evolution in the schools, uh, just postmodern relativism and being told you have to accept, you know, a kid who comes to school and identifies. And I, I get this. I saw this the other day. A person who was having surgery because they identified as a dog, okay, dressed themselves and went around as a dog. And I look at that and go, I, I don't have to accept that. But our kids are taught you do have to accept that. And so there's a whole nother element I think when it comes to conceptual things and what culture's telling our children. So, uh, yeah, I think there's some serious issues in front of us, especially for those that are. I'm about to have my first grandbaby. Uh, my kids are going to, it's going to be harder on them as parents than, than it was on me as a parent. And my generation was harder as a parent than it was on my parents. And that's just the direction we're moving. So, I, I hope that addresses that. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. I, I think the word love is okay. I mean, love is love is love.
has certainly been redefined. You know, love, love is not necessary. Biblical love, and that's the way most folks in this room would, we would take into consideration how does the Bible define love? And, and it's not just acceptance of anything and everything. It, 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 love is always looking to the end of its object. Jesus loved, so he died. Okay? It, he didn't just say, come as you are and I'll accept you. How you are is not right in the eyes of God, and I'll die and make a sacrifice to fix that, but you're going to have to make some changes. That's love. But that's not the way the culture defines it. And so I don't, I don't know that it's so much that it's overused. It's just not properly defined. And again, our standards have changed. That's the way that I see that. But I think you're right. You know, uh, we're just told live and let live. Uh, you know, all these little mantras that you see. So you remember when Nike first started their big just do it campaign? Uh, that's, the, that's what our culture's bought into. Just do it. Be yourself. Whatever you want to do. And so it's, uh, I just keep coming back to this because this is what I see. And this is what I see in the Bible. Culture kills us. It got the people in the Old Testament. It got the children of Israel when they landed in the land of Canaan. It got the children of Israel when they came back from Babylonian captivity. It was the day in which Jesus lives. And it's what God's people have been fighting ever since. We, we just, we have to be strangers and pilgrims. We're talking to Brother Walcott about... Uh, citizenship and uh you know uh you you can you can become a resident alien of this country you're not a citizen a full citizen yet but you live here within the laws uh, my son-in-law was not a naturalized american he wasn't born in this country uh and it took him a long time to, to get his citizenship for a long time he was a resident alien he lived here but that wasn't his home and that's the word that's used in Hebrews 11 and 1 Peter chapter 2 about us in the world. We, we live here, but our citizenship, it, it belongs to a different kingdom, a different government. And we have to see ourselves that way. And, and y'all have traveled overseas. You know, if you've traveled overseas, man, you get that. I went to India. I'm 6'2 and bald-headed and fairly fair-complected. And I was in South Central India where the average Indian man is probably about 5'9", five, 5'8", five, and very dark complected. And I knew I was not at home when I was there. You just look around. That's the mindset we have to adopt, folks. Uh, I know we care about our country. I know we're concerned about the direction of the government. I know we're concerned about the administration and the election that's coming up. And I'm going to tell you something. Putting the right people in office is not the solution. Could it help? Yeah, I'm not saying don't participate. What I am saying is make sure your loyalty is not the here and now. It's in heaven to the reign of Jesus Christ and his government, and that's where our passion needs to be. Uh, so culture just always kills us, and that's, that's just what I'm going to come back to when you're talking about stuff like this. Yes, sir. Watching sports, you'll see it. There is a movement that says Jesus gets us. Have you seen that? I've seen the billboards. Yeah, I haven't chased it down much. I'm wondering if that's trying to put Jesus into a role of accepting things that are going on that is not in the Bible. Well, that, that's not the way I've taken that. But I, again, I haven't really followed. I do think that there. I think there are lots of folks out there who consider themselves Christians who have some good moral standards who who would offer, yeah, Jesus understands us. And that's the way I've always took that. Not that he accepts us. But that he understands, and if you're looking for answers in your life, that's where they are. Uh, but that's that's kind of the way I would take that. Yes, sir. And what you'll see, for the most part, is the illustration that Jesus was willing to sit with yeah. sinners. Yeah. and minister to yeah. sinners, right? Okay. And, and that just because you're downtrodden doesn't mean that you cannot become yeah. part of uh, which, which is Christ. Which was the point of our discussion last night about the right. prodigal son. And that's that's the point. And that's the way I would understand that. Uh, now, that's not to say some people might not offer, hey, you know, come as you are. I mean, that's the religious world. 
I mean, would you have thought that the major denominations would have been arguing over whether they accept homosexuality? I never would have dreamed that in my youth. And so there, there is a movement among religious people that says, well, we just need to accept everybody and love everybody and take them as they are. But uh, again, my experience with that is limited. You, you see movements like that occasionally. You remember what was it a couple of decades ago, the little, what would Jesus do, armbands? You know, there, there are folks out there that get what we're talking about that are concerned about the culture, uh, even though they might not doctrinally agree with us about a lot of things. There are some people who see it, no question. Anybody else? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I want to share an um, experience with you. My English is a little bit different, yes, okay. but I'm going to talk. No. Um, I want to share something that happened in my, in my family. Mm -hmm. my, um, um, this, I have a, a daughter, granddaughter, and she has a little boy, four years. And the family, four? Four years. Okay, four. And uh, he's so curious. That he always is watching the way that his mom is dressing. Mm -hmm. She always go to the um, to outside with a uh, pants, short pants, that you can see through. Mm -hmm. And then he was telling his grandma, my daughter, he said, "You see, that's my mom. She don't have no underwear." And. Uh, the next day, she was gonna, she was taken to the daycare, uh, to school, and he looked at her, and uh, he said, you're not going with me to school like that. So she gets so furious, she said, you don't wanna tell me what to wear. Mm -hmm. But he said, no, you look disgusting. Mm -hmm. Four tears, mm -hmm. and, and my daughter said, what is that, where did that come from? So he don't see nothing, mm -hmm. I don't know where he gets, all this stuff you don't like to see naked, uh, his mom, my god, my daughter, and um, I say, Amanda, why you dress like, like that? You can get hurt in the street, but she don't care. Yeah, and it's interesting, you know, kids, when Jesus said, you, you have to become a little child. You know, little kids sometimes <laughs> see things much more clearly. No, not all the time. They are a product of their environment, but uh, there is a sense. I do believe that, that we have a sense of morality of ought, what we ought to do. And I think it's because we're created in the image of God. I tell you, I go back to my illustration a while ago. You, you take somebody who tell you there is no right or wrong and tell them I'm about to take your car away from you. You know what they're going to say? That ain't right. <laughs> and I'm going to go, there is no right. Everybody's got it at some point, this sense of, of what's right and wrong. And I think kids a lot of times, you know, sometimes we teach it out of them instead of teaching it into them. So I, I, that doesn't surprise me, you know. It just doesn't surprise me. All right. Well, I appreciate your attention uh, this morning. Hope those things will give you some things to think about. I, I know you had a lot of stuff you could be doing this morning, and uh, I'm, I'm glad you're here, and I hope that study will help you. Uh, we're going to look at... Uh, some principles from Leviticus here in a couple of hours. So uh, if you want to come back, we'd be glad to have you.